It's up and recording. Hello, welcome everybody to the Yongin Chapter uh, virtual welcome table and uh, symposium happy hour. Uh, we are going to have a few guided discussions and uh, mostly it's just relaxed, sit back, feel like you can unmute yourself and contribute to the conversation just as you would if we were uh, out to dinner or uh, hanging out at the at the cafe there at the normal face-to-face -face, uh, international conference. And so uh, my name is James Rush. Uh, I believe I know all of you fairly well, except for maybe Kirsten, but Kirsten, I have heard your voice on more than one occasion, uh, especially with the, the podcast that was done with Greg. So welcome. And uh, hopefully others coming in will uh, feel very, very much a part of this whole uh, scene. Uh, I am going to uh, share my screen just for the, for the effect. <laughs> um, and the whole, again, goal and focus is to kind of get a uh, insight into our uh, chapter a little bit, but also give you a chance to hang out and talk and socialize. I don't know how many of you were able to attend the I'm only doing this on one screen, so I apologize. Um, and there, maybe. Uh, on Saturday, the Busan chapter had their game night. And so um, by a show, show of applause and or uh, chat room contributions, how many of you were able to uh, attend that game night? Nice. Glad that you were able to do that. And I think I'm sharing my desktop at this point, yeah? So there we are. And the guided discussions are going to include a few uh, people that are part of our chapter. And what that's gonna look like is uh, this first part, this first all oh, about 15 minutes, 20 minutes or so, uh, maybe a Q&A session, but a weekend summary, what took place on Friday uh, through the weekend, and then even some of the activities and events that took place through today, um, just your insights, things that you were able to um, really get interested in. You're like, ah, I want to want to make sure I double back and take some notes on that presentation, or you talked to some people in the hallway, and you're like, ah, I need to make sure that I uh, go and check that out. But um, this first part is going to be this uh, kind of initial insights. Then a little bit later on, we'll be talking with Greg Lewis, uh, and he'll be sharing about the podcasting that the Yongin chapter has been doing. Then we get into our, our core. If we, if we have a plenary speaker or a keynote speakers for our session tonight, it would be uh, Martin, uh, Bien, and David uh, Barry. And that would be uh, the discussion about uh, how they've witnessed English camps over the last uh, two sessions because you had last summer and then this winter. And then finally with tech tips, if we're still awake and if you're having a frothy beverage and not tipsy, um, but even if you are sharing a little bit of uh, tech tips and ideas there. So uh, I am going to get back into uh, just a full screen of things. Stop share should be what's happening. And <clears throat> within this group, within this space, uh, we're just talking about what happened uh, fr since Friday all the way up until dinner time today. Um, I want you to kind of put it out there. One speaker or one conversation that you had uh, and we can make this interactive so people can see that in the chat room. And then I'll ask uh, for people to go ahead and share in a, uh, in a more vocal and with the group. So as you put it in there, what's, who is one speaker that you would recommend that everybody go to if they haven't already seen that speaker? Lindsay Heron. Lindsay Heron, oh, nice, all right. <laughs> Thank you. 
I'm trying to think of what I've what I've seen. There was so much good stuff. Thank you, Kara. Yeah, Sophia. Last night, I I was paying it 50-50 uh, attention, and I saw Wayne mentioned on there. He's like, ah, there's so many good nuggets that I need to go back and watch this again. Wayne, you and I might have to watch that together or something because I was like 50-50 trying to plan with something else, and I thought I could, I thought I could have two screens going at once, and that was just a mistake. <laughs> Oh, well, it is yeah. now on the uh, YouTube playlist, so check it out if you haven't uh, caught all the details. Sweet. Oh, we got a we got a second one for and recommend that Gerd's yep yeah, opening speech there. Great. Well, um, as we move forward, I'm wondering why. You know, there's the there's the who or the what, but the now we want to get into the why and. In particular, and the reason why I invited Lindsay to stick around is because I think it's really helpful for the, uh, the leaders. And I'm glad that Michael has stepped in. Hello. Kudos to you. You super awesome dude. Um, I am uh, wanting to make sure that they get the most concrete, immediate feedback for the efforts that they put in and, and the program committee and the many other people um, so that as they start thinking about national events, the pan SIGs, and then the next international conference, they can get some of that immediate feedback. So why? What was it that stuck out about the, the speakers and those sessions that you were uh, impressed by? Uh, was it just the content? Was it something else about the, the delivery? I'll jump in with why I think people should revisit Gerd's speech. And it's, it's one of those things where, unfortunately, at the time that that was happening, I was actually teaching online. And so I didn't get to see it live. But having watched it since then, and I've now watched it twice, uh, and I'll uh, probably watch it again. Not just because of the content, although the content was awesome. It's because of the absolutely wonderful integration of the graphics, the slides, the videos, and what he was saying. Okay. It's really like a masterclass in how to interact in the digital age in such a way that your audience is completely engaged with you and completely drawn into what you are saying. I, I found it absolutely humbling to, to watch this. And I thought, oh my God, am I That's ever gonna, I'll never get there, I'll never get there. <laughs> That's a great point. Uh, Michael or Lindsay, have you had a chance, or maybe Greg during your conversation, I haven't heard the whole podcast, did he mention anything about his team, his, the people, or is he doing all that on his own? I don't think he is, but that's, uh, you know, being able to get the graphics and all the details. Is there insight into that? He, uh, he refers to it as his team mo most often. Okay. But it's basically, it's, he is, uh, if I, if I have it right and, and Lindsay can, can jump in on this, but it, it seems like it's, it's, him but it's it's his concepts with many hands okay you, you know what i mean right that, yeah that's, that's what it seems like to me and the preparation for just the whole thing and looking at more um uh speakers like him and i think google just picked up on the searches that i was doing but i ended up getting virtual speakers and there was a, a group i believe out of canada uh but then and that's great. It's awesome. Uh, <laughs> but the, the main thing about them was how they were promoting themselves and really marketing themselves as virtual online coaches, virtual speakers, and how they had that, that one specific niche. And I was thinking about trying to get them to maybe sponsor a session or something and, and uh, if not kind of throw in a, a speaker or whatnot. But um, Wayne, I know that you've done a lot with your uh, background in your your virtual visual storytelling. Um, how easy are some of those things? Would you imagine his team 
really having a, a deep dive or are they? Uh, Based on my experience, trying to do presentations like that, I can kind of understand how he's doing it with like the green screen. Um, he's obviously, it's not a video in the background of his presentations because you can see he's using, you know, on those PPT remotes. Um, I think the team, a lot of the work they will be spent on is just making all those nice effects in the background. Uh, that was a question I was thinking of asking him actually, like, why, which software did you use or mm. does his team use to make those backgrounds? Because um, I, can, I can imagine myself doing something like that if I made the video to just play kind of automatically in the background, but I have no idea what software he would use to, you know, like click next on all that stuff he's doing. Okay. Yeah, Great. it's the software that was the, uh, is the part I want, I asked him about that and uh, uh, he kind of deflected and asked me what I was using and then never answered my question. Um, but he, I agree with you. I think it's his, the, the work of the team is in the background. And then when he's actually speaking, he's just running it himself. Um, click, click through, like you say. Um, but uh James, you asked me just in, in talking to him, um, you know, what I might've picked up. But one of the things I did pick up was that he's, he's quite humble. And uh, I talked to him about his music a little bit, and, uh, um, very approachable. So I think if you really wanted to get into it, he would, but uh, uh, at the time I talked to him, it wasn't going to. Okay. Uh, and yeah. As Michael mentions over in the chat room, these highlights, um, I'm, you know, GERD, um, the other speakers, what were some of the, I didn't necessarily notice the same uh, extravagance or whatever as far as uh, bells and whistles and, and technology infused virtual speaking, but uh, what were some of the other speakers, um, what was the draw and why did you mention them in the, in the chat room? I, I mentioned the uh, graduate student showcase because I think that if we don't mention them, they're gonna they will fall by the wayside. They'll they'll not get they'll not get mentioned. I'm a bit uh, predictable in my choices because I tend to promote the you know my highlights tend to mirror what's on the main stage. But but that's that's okay. I'm okay with that. Um, I think they did a really really good job. I think it was really nice. I think we can build on that. Uh, you know, and I want, I, but for the purposes of the question, I just, I wanted to support them. I wanted to be there and go, hey, you know what, the chair's here. Not that I'm super duper important because I'm the chair. I mean, you know, somebody's there. I remember when I was a grad student and it was like, you know, if you had grad meetings, it was like in the corner, you know, <laughs> you huddled down together having smokes, you know, in the, no, no, sorry, sorry, mom, not having smokes you know, outside in the rain discussing Heidegger or, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, so I thought, I thought that was, I, I, you know, that was one reason why I would, I would push them up towards the top. But uh, I think to turn the question to my own devices, I would want us to get on Discord and really encourage people to get to that Discord channel that says our, our highlights or highlights of the day Mm -hmm. and and get them to post what their highlights are like james you did that this morning i think uh and i've done it and Lindsay's done it but we need to get people on there at, and saying you know hey here's this great concurrent session that i saw about whatever i heard in through the grapevine that uh, brian al alican 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 i think he had a really great presentation have no idea don't know who he is he seems amazing let's could be sure let let's let's get him up there. Let's give him a book. Let's let's talk. Oh, thanks, baby. Thanks. Yeah. My not you. My my wife's annoyed at me. <laughs> He's always annoyed. At um. Me. Yeah, I've heard Brian Alcama speak before, but uh, I didn't catch his session this time around, and I was actually very sorry. I missed it again. You know, uh, other stuff got in the way and um he is he's good he knows his stuff and uh yeah i'd recommend him i'd support him yeah i mean i'm just saying you know get let's get concurrence into the spotlight 
you know, because I'm I'm lo I'm lost a, a, a little. I'm not lost. I'm 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 happy as a pig in shit, you know, doing stuff for Sophia Mavridi. I mean, like, give me some leather boots and a little bit of feta cheese, and I'm fine. You know, that's great. We're not recording this, are we? Delete we are that. recording it, Michael. Delete it. Delete it. Sorry. Delete it. Uh, I mean, discussing uh, digital pedagogies, of course. <laughs> hey, I'm out. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's great. It's uh, authenticity, and uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll. No, we'll no, no. It. But uh, you know, to get, I, I, I'm in touch. I'm in touch, and and well, I mean, Lindsay's in touch with everybody, but I'm in, I'm in touch with the plenaries and and Gur and whatever, and uh, and I love that. But I miss, I miss the, you know, the meat, the meat and the gristle of of the conference for that. I miss those great discoveries like like seeing Brian or seeing people whose names you know we we don't know we you know we don't know the the name of that person or whatever but they come up with these things that are just amazing. I mean I saw a guy from Seoul National University a few years ago who talked about content content learning in his classroom and I was just like you're you're amazing and he's like dude my name's Nick I'm not amazing I just work here. <laughs> but he's great, you know and the, these are the people, in addition to the, the highlighters, in addition to the plenaries, in addition to the invited speakers, that, that we should really be recognizing, I think. O'Neill. Come on. Yeah, I just got, got kicked out of my uh, office. Our security badges won't be working tomorrow morning unless I take care of it, so. <laughs> No problem. It's okay. We're still online and recording. <laughs> Welcome to conferencing. All right. I'll see you guys. Later. Uh, before before you take off, and so and so, Lindsay also has uh, some nuggets to take away. One thing, I think this conference has absolutely been a perfect fit for your personality, Michael Free. And one reason is because of your knowledge of people, and certainly your you know self interest in terms of who you've recruited and made contacts with, but your acknowledgement of names, um, that's huge uh, within this virtual space, but just any, any given time. I mean, Brian Riesbeck touched on that in terms of his presentations um, and his research and studies, but uh, I just wanna make sure that I give a, a public kudos and round of applause to, to Michael. Um, and then also for Lindsay, I, I think you're, you're pretty good at that kind of stuff and multitasking, but moving ahead, how do we make sure that we virtually acknowledge those people that we, in, in those opening sessions and those closing certificate sessions, we do a pretty good job of in the face-to-face -face stuff, but it, how does that look and work in, the, in these kinds of conferences? So uh, I still see seven minutes on this time. Other uh, presenters or, you know, how, what's your feelings about the, that Discord hallway space? Has anybody had a, a non-in-presentation conversation with somebody? I must say, I, I don't know whether it's the, the sort of my timing or whatever that, that is off. Being almost halfway around the world from you guys may have some effect on it but I I seem to get on there when there's just about nobody else there <laughs> and I sort of hello hi uh, anyone <laughs> okay bye <laughs> I drift away. I, I noticed Sophia was on there last night, and I just I didn't ha I had nothing left for for yeah. her. That's not a euphemism. That's just I was really tired, and I was yeah. like, oh, sorry, you know, I I can't I can't talk to you <laughs> right now. I'm going to yeah. bed. Um, but uh, I I think this is it. It's a learning. It's a learning point for us where now we've got it so that people, I mean, people are a little bit, I don't know if they're reticent, but they don't really, how do I put it? I mean, they don't, and I'm the same. I'm like, well, why should I go to Discord? But I'm the, I'm the organizer. I'm like, well, why should I go to Discord? If, if other people are there, they're like, what's, what's Discord? I don't want to go on there and be, and be by myself. Well, maybe you are, I don't, I don't know. Maybe I'll just run into that weirdo Greg, I'm not sure. 
maybe we're into that 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 you know the the Bulgarian auteur uh, Overbeek or whatever, you know, or maybe I'll get lucky and and run into Theophilus. So, you know, who who knows what what will happen? It's you know people are getting used to this a little bit. I, I yeah. guess I don't, but there's so much that I just I just don't know about how people are or gauging it and, and interacting with it and why they're reticent. It's it's very, it's very, very complicated. <laughs> well, Good. I, I think that a lot of the interactions that I kind of envisioned happening in Discord, uh, like being synchronous with the plenaries and everything, that's all happening here in Zoom instead. And uh, yeah. okay. I mean, today there have been a whole bunch of conversations popping up on, on Discord too, but I think people aren't quite accustomed to the asynchronous nature of the interaction on it. So Leone, next time you pop in, ask a question and then pop out. And then when you come back, maybe there'll be some interesting answers and you can continue it that way. Noted, noted. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think, I, go ahead, sorry, yeah. valid, valid point. We had something like about a 25 minute discussion after yesterday's presentation on um, um, English as a medium of instruction uh, that got really intense at one point, but it continued on Zoom. It didn't go to Discord. And that's fair, but I did see a lot of discussion about Willy Renandia's uh, presentation afterwards, which I thought was really, really awesome that people did take it from the plenary space into this, you know, virtual hallway and could continue it over, I guess it was technically after lunch or around lunchtime, but over coffee anyway. He's a winner, that, that Willy, he brings people in. Yep, good. Uh, I, I will make note that right after the, uh, right after Gerd's uh, keynote and then the panel discussion that night, um, Lisa and uh, Dawn, both in, from Japan area, they were both just kind of uh, searching through Discord. And I, same thing, I fell into the conversation there and I noticed that Lisa was there and then dropped out. Well, I had done the same thing, similar to Leone, uh, earlier in the day on Friday, or maybe it was Thursday night. And I was like, what's this? How do I, how do I use the video do I, with the voice? What's so happening with the voice? And uh, I saw that she jumped in there. And then before I could even have, like go into that space, it's called the video and voice uh, co communications or conversation. Uh, she had gone, she had left out. So I sent her a direct message to say, Hey, you know, I, I heard you in the panel discussion. And also, I just saw that you were in this space. Do you want to go and try and check it out together so we don't feel so awkward? <laughs> so, yeah, and we ended up being a pretty good conversation. So, yeah, the getting the ball rolling and trying to drag people in and uh, we're, we'll, we'll all get through this together. Got a couple more minutes and we have a, a couple new uh, people as well. Uh, uh, MK. Uh, Ask, Fillmore. Ask Fillmore where he's from. Yeah, Fillmore, where are you from there, sir? Hi, I'm from the Philippines. That is I right. think I've been with you in various sessions yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> and I also just, the very fast Michael Free. I was, I was just uh, listening to Michael Free's instructions. But yes, please, what's your impressions of the last three, uh, three days? Okay, last three days. Uh, first, I missed the, I think the opening session. I'm glad it's on YouTube so I can go back to it. And I think it's a good thing as far as, you know, catching up with things that you missed. That's the good thing of the, you know, of, of the setup. Good. And uh, surprising or uh, like a, session, a speaker that you would really like to recommend that others uh, watch the video afterwards? Mm, uh, last night's event with, with Sophia, that's a blast. I think, yeah, it's a really good session and we enjoyed that a lot. Sweet. Two for two on the plenaries as well. Nice. Uh, and Ronnie, uh, Mr. Kamru uh, Zaman, who you would suppose is out of country, but actually is right there in Daejeon. Um, 
how are you doing? Are you, are you, you there? Just listening in. I've had a chance to interact with him. That's been a bl uh, real neat blessing to me is that, uh, so he mentioned that from uh, Bangladesh, as well as there's been a couple other people from out of country that they're really considering how to make this kind of conference and these kinds of exchanges and the ideas that are being talked about in those presentations, how do you work in some countries and some situations that aren't as connected as, as we are to even be able to pull this off? <laughs> so um, that's worth our consideration, right? Well, um, it is now 726, so staying on task and on time as, as best possible. Um, the next series of questions and the next focus was going to be uh, towards uh, Greg and podcasting. Uh, Lindsay, I, I think you, if you did want to stick around, any lasting impressions before I make this final transition or... Um, uh, well, I don't want to necessarily leave uh, y'all with my thoughts okay? because I've been too busy to actually see most of the sessions, but I would like to invite everybody to uh, contribute their ideas and requests for next year's conference, the 2022 Cotisol International Conference. Uh, I'm going to be chairing it. It's going to be in the spring, probably in May, possibly April. It depends. I'm hoping it'll be hybrid. And the theme is going to be more than words, teaching for a better world. So start mm -hmm. thinking now about who you would like to see address this topic about why we teach, how we can improve the world, how we can improve our students' lives, how we can improve other teachers' lives mm -hmm. through our teaching, our research, our professional development like that. So if you know somebody who would be great for that, let me know. I've got a few keynote type plenary people in mind, but I would definitely like to open it up to all of you for uh, input, suggestions, feedback, and uh, what kind of formats you like in this year's conference that we should carry on to next year. Since I had both you, Lindsay and Michael here, I've had two questions that have been, have been raised a couple times and I don't, you maybe you've addressed them or maybe not. Um, how are our registration, how's registration doing? I was actually asked, is this making you guys any money? <laughs> but in one way, but uh, how are registrations? And then also the timing of this, can we get a, a short brief answer for how the final decision came for this time of, this time of year, this week long extravaganza? Well, the timing is Michael. Um, I can answer the question about the registrations though. Uh, I don't think we're gonna lose money on this conference. Okay. I think we're gonna break even. We might make a little bit. Our registration numbers are probably the lowest they've been in uh, more than a decade, I wanna say, but that's okay. Um, we have enough people, like I said, to, to break even and also maybe make money and keep this a very small, personal, I think, uh, yeah. personal but distant kind of conference. So right. I, I'm actually pretty satisfied with the numbers. Great. Cool. But yeah, ask Michael. Michael, why, why are we doing a 10-day thing in February, man? Uh, because, well... The, the short glib answer is because whatever you choose is wrong. Mm. Um, the, lo the longer answer is uh, I had originally thought of doing this in earlier February. And the reason why I had thought of that is because the, the backbone of this is really, you know, the, the, team that, the team that drives this, and this does not, uh, or maybe it does for some people, feed into the idea that we're all uh, university teachers, but the, the the team that makes this thing go are, they tend to be university teachers. And if we could get them on their vacation and we could spread this out, you know, that was sort of the basic idea. But Dave Schaefer, always the curmudgeonly, but, but lovable, but lovable guy. And I always think of him like in terms of a Christmas Carol, because that's kind of his thing pointed out that if we did it earlier in February, we were gonna run into Solav 
And immediately I'm like, I don't want to have anything to do with Solal at all in any way, because we would have to stop this in the middle. Forget it. In Korea, that's just, we would just, it would be, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. I would like it to be earlier in February if we keep it in, in here so that it's way much before the beginning of, of the, the spring semester for university teachers, i.e. the people who are, you know, carrying the logs and lighting the fires and whatnot. But, you know, I, I mean, I'm open. I, I'm, I don't care anymore. I'm, I'm leaving, so it's fine. <laughs> Good. Well, um, thank you for getting that onto the record. Now that you have uh, put a few things out there, we, we may we may not post this, but if we do, they've got a lot more fodder for discussion. Um, and I hope that this has been helpful for you, Lindsay, as far as prepping and preparing. And certainly thank you for putting that, that call to us as far as really being um, contributors to the, to the theme. I think that's one thing I've appreciated about Quotisal is it's always given the opportunity to get involved where you are interested in or uh, just ask a question and, and see how you can lend a helping hand. So. All right, uh, moving on into the uh, next stage session, uh, depending on what you looked at it with the abstract and preview and, and other details, we have Greg Lewis uh, has taken on the, the task of being a podcast host and uh, by a round of uh, answers, no applause yet, just yet. Uh, but have you listened to any of the podcasts? Uh, was that part of your preparation for the for the conference? Did you get a little bit of a, a taste, a little bit of an understanding of what was going to be taken uh, place by these speakers? And so either a thumbs up in the in the uh, reactions or a message in the chat room would be very helpful for that. Yeah, thank you, Wayne, for throwing that in there. Leonie, I am doubly upset. No, I'm not. I'm just kidding. Uh, it's uh, all right. We understand. We'll make it we'll make it up by making sure that you get invited into one of those sessions. Well, um, the Hope and the idea uh, was to make sure that we um, we didn't, you know, certainly didn't take the the content for of what they were going to deliver, but we really wanted just to promote it. We knew that this was going to be a very different uh, international conference, and the variety of ways that uh, people are drawn into uh, new and different spaces. We wanted to get uh, an idea of who our speakers were and what was gonna be uh, the, the general uh, gist of, of what they're gonna be speaking But More importantly, get to know who they were. And I'll let Greg explain some of his thought process as well as maybe even a, a couple of the other um, interviews that he took place, that took place with him. Greg, uh, thank you for being here tonight as part of our session, but also for being willing to discuss a little bit of these podcast things, so. Well, my, uh, my pleasure, James. Um, thank you for, uh, for warming us up. Actually, I had several questions there. I, I, I kind of wondered, I don't know if Michael's still there, but I thought, where do old not old, but where do old chair people go? If, if, if Lindsay's taking over, <laughs> what happens to a Michael? We, we end up in Kangwon, Greg. <laughs> we, we make Makali and we live in Hanok houses if we're very, very lucky. Well, that doesn't sound too bad. <laughs> no, it, it's really not. But if we're not lucky, we end up at like the, the, the girl in uh, Sopionte, the film we watched last night. Which I missed. Yeah, it, it's it's not a happy ending. It was a musical too. Well, yeah, but they they say it's a musical, but they also said that Busan Hang was a comedy. So you know, who knows what they're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> well, 
that was just sort of a, a thought I had and uh, uh, wondered a little bit about um, what's uh, possible. Um, am I sharing my uh, PowerPoint there now? Yes. Yep, it is up. Cool. We're time-wise, we're down to just five minutes for you, just to let you know. So, but five. again, this is this is just a, a planner, and um, I also had put in an extra ten minutes of a of a break time at that point. So, I am I am as flexible as the crowd is, and I am only here as a a, a host. <laughs> so. Well, this looks formal, but it's not. It's, uh, I just thought, well, let's see what kind of questions are out there and what kind of answers we can come up with. And uh, it is what it is. Um, I, I, I'm just sort of anticipating what kinds of questions people have. And some of them are kind of basic questions, like just simply, what is a podcast? Uh, there's... Uh, a lot of people see podcasts or imagine podcasts to be like a video that they see on YouTube. Um, those are popular, um, but they're not, strictly speaking, a podcast. Like A, a podcast started uh, because of audio on an iPod, um, and it's just a, a portmanteau between... Um, uh, the iPod and broadcast. Um, so that's really all, all that it is, but it's, it has a long, long history, uh, which we, we don't necessarily have to get into, but uh, it is an audio thing. Um, and arguably, um, in, in my, my perspective, that it has a lot of value. I, I fell in love with these when they were, when I was a kid and listening to uh, old uh, radio shows, um, the Green Lantern and the, I can't remember the one with the squeaky door. Uh, you know, those sound effects actually, I kind of fell in love with. Um, th that's sort of where it kind of began for me. And then as an adult, I, I got listening to other radio plays and then really much later got into what's the sort of the modern interview type uh, podcasts, which are really the simplest and the most popular right now. Um, you don't have to do too much writing and creating on your own. So, um, but all in audio, just uh, strictly audio. Uh, another question I get is where can I find podcasts? Um, and I just took a list uh, of, of podcasts. You can get them where they strictly play on on an i on the iOS uh, operating system, and then other ones that play strictly or yeah you know, play strictly on a uh, uh, Android, and then ones that go across. Um, I can't speak for a lot of these. I, I use um, the uh, Apple um, podcasts one. Sorry, not the Apple. The Google Google. Um, podcast one. Uh, I've tried Player FM, uh, Stitcher some time ago. Uh, so I can't really vote for these. You kind of have to go through and see what they have and um, uh, find things, look for things that are of interest to you. Uh, that's, that's really, it's like channel surfing, basically. Um, the topic came up, I think, at one of our meetings about just you know, our podcasts, uh, even something that people are interested in. And it, they, they have always been of interest to people. Um, and they kind of get hit with the, uh, the visual, uh, you know, videos, uh, video blogs, um, you know, YouTube, those things. But they've never knocked it out of the race. And in fact, uh, podcasts have continued to grow um, slowly, slowly, uh, you know, sort of up against uh, the sort of the, the tide of new technological advances, uh, which is quite, quite nice to see. I just pulled these stats from this uh, uh, pod uh, in podcast insights, um, and they're taking them from uh, various uh, statistic gathering places like Nielsen, uh, Infinite Dial. Okay. Um, but just to show that the things are really kind of growing. Um, 
this is old style. How do, how do you make a podcast? Uh, like if you're recording something and you needed sound effects, this is something that I, I love to kind of play with, but I'm not doing a scripted thing. Um, this, uh, the Foley stage uh, is, is from the old days. Um, but I did want to ask um, if you do listen to podcasts, if you're aware of what a podcast is, uh, and you do listen to them. I'm curious uh, just how many, and if you can just unmute your mics, uh, if I can just see, uh, get an idea of how many hours a week that you listen to podcasts. Uh, probably about four or five. And my top three is uh, true crime stories. Mm -hmm. Very popular. Um, wow. uh, the uh, discussion of the history of jazz. Uh, not sure what the title of it is, but uh, um, it's a really good one. And uh, finally, uh, Springbok Radio, which takes me back to South Africa. Mm. <laughs> Very sports focused or is it kind of general news everything? No, Springbok Radio was like Fox Channel, it, it covered everything. It had news, it had dramas, it had music, it had, you know, it had everything. Uh, it had people like Esma Evrard and in our friend Jan, who would give you wonderful recipes. And it had uh, Inspector Carr investigates and <laughs> stuff like mm. that. So, um, it was really a catch-all. And somebody has taken a lot of the Springbok Radio um, episodes and put them into a podcast where it's sort of sandwiched, discussing the, the actual uh, episode, the show, the history of the show, listening to the show, and then uh, discussing it afterwards. Why was it popular? Why was it not popular? How long did it run? Things like that. Mm. So, yeah. Oh, interesting. And none of those are like an interview t style. Is that right? They're no. like, yeah. No. Yeah. That's interesting because the, the, statistically the, the, uh, the interviews are the most common to be made, but it's the, the, the dramas and like the true crime uh, and, and educational ones that are, are uh, the top. You know, not, not yeah. interviews. Cool. Thank you, Lily. Anybody Greg, else? I'm, I'm very curious as to how, uh, how have you, uh, you know, felt, uh, grown, like what's been your thinking process through this whole thing? Like, how has it kind of sharpened some of your skills for, you know, either technology or, uh, interactions with people in this new well space. <clears throat> it's 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 definitely um i've grown a lot uh, uh i'd have to say um i'm trying to get out of this uh uh i, I i've grown a, a lot and learned a lot and um I think that probably one of the biggest things is how quickly I become, uh, it sounds weird, but quickly I become intimate with, with someone. I'm not intimate in, in a rude way or anything like that. I just mean to become someone I don't even know to be then speaking to like this face to face suddenly and talk and I'm asking them questions. I have their undivided attention for like an hour sometimes and I'm asking them questions about their life and what makes them tick and why did they do this or why did they do that? And it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing uh, opportunity, an amazing perspective uh, to um, amazing access to have actually. Um, it's kind of almost what, uh, to me, the, the draw of going to a conference like this, and I, I had this mix in between as far as like VIPs and a number of others who are coming in from 
you know, other countries or otherwise. And I just want to know what's happening out there and in the world. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I joined up with publicity, because I felt like that was a great opportunity that I was going to be able to sit with crashing and just mm -hmm. have a coffee. And that was my responsibility was to make sure that that happened. And so um, that's, it is very much a, 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 a benefit, but um, you also, it, it comes with a, like a, a strong feeling of responsibility for sure. Um, well, my goal to sort of, I think where you're, you're trying to uh, move this towards is my goal is to uh, attract people that are, are unaware of, of Koti cell or relatively unaware uh, or who want to learn some more about it. And it's just another way to, it's another, it's a communication tool. It's just another way to, to get people to ask some questions, to hear a little bit, to become interested um, in, in Koti cell and what, what's going on here. Um, I, I see it as a, as a tool for that. And that's what I would like to do. Um, having said that, um, I'm, I'm not sure that having a podcast about what everybody is doing, like for example, for the, for the international conference, um, I think that is for people who are in Cotisol and who are aware of Cotisol. I don't feel like it's reaching out enough for me, reaching out to try and tickle the attention of people that are, are walking past. Mm. Um, and so uh, what I'm looking for is some input on uh, how um, sort of a theme or um, a direction that uh, people think would be uh, fitting for um, this coming year. And I've, I've kind of divided the year into, uh, you know, spring, summer, fall, um, uh, sort of a sections, I guess you could say. Um, and ha having said that, so saying that, that that's really what my thought is, I'm really curious to hear what uh, other people um, think about the podcast and the way it can really do a good job. I have an idea. Bring it on, Michael. What's your idea? Because otherwise I have to deal with this comment by Leone. Well, he, you know, he brought it up already. And I just, I just, uh, I Googled it. Uh, OTR.com, oldtimeradio.com. Okay. Old time radio shows. Yeah. And these old time radio shows, they're, 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 you know, they're very retro. So they're hip in some, they're hip in some places and they're not hip in other places. And that's fine. I, I did one of these with a speaking class, a pronunciation class slash speaking class. Hmm. And um, it, didn't, it didn't pan out in the end because there weren't enough people in it. But what I wanted to do, and they were really excited to do it, was go through the process of taking one of these old scripts from the Black Museum, which is what you were, you were asking about before, Greg. Uh, that was the, the squeaking, welcome behind the creaking door. Mm -hmm. like that. You can get all of those, every, all of it. You can get the scripts online. You can get the, the recordings online. You can go into, and it really, it play, I mean, just from a pronunciation standpoint, it plays with pronunciation so beautifully in a, in a weird way. It's like, you have to be someone else. And then you also get the sound effects that you were talking about with the Foley room. Like, okay, how do you make mm -hmm. it sound like a dead body falling on the ground? Right. Well, what do you mean? Well, okay, it's like, who's falling on the ground? Is it your schnauzer? Or is it Mike Free, who's like 300 pounds? I'm not 300 pounds, by the way. Like, and they, they have to get, they have to go through this whole process. But if we do this, or if we were to entertain the idea of doing it, you know, there, there's the possibility of showcasing students' work from various places, irregardless of, of age or whatever, yeah, yeah, uh, and we can we can also do it ourselves because it's just fun, my God, and just like have a good have a good time with it, you know. So why didn't it work? Like you said, you didn't have the numbers. You mean just the numbers for the characters in your for the script you yeah, had? Yeah, the, the numbers of students. It was it was quite a small class, and people weren't showing up. So it, that, I mean, that's the that's why it didn't work. 
uh, we didn't end up getting, you know, because one guy, he, you know, he had to hit a frog and then he had to be like a little girl, like two seconds later. It didn't, it just, you know, too many characters. Right. Right. And and so did was the the idea that you have them practice this and was it to publish it, make it public? I wanted, I wanted them there there in lieu of a a uh, an exam. They were going to record, uh, mm. you know, they were going to prepare as like in, in a project style, a an, an actual episode where where like the final product was the the twenty minute or eighteen minute, you know through the creaking door kind of episode thing right that is cool yeah that's that's right up exactly kind of what i'm i'm looking for uh yeah i know i know it is <laughs> that's 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 really exciting um i'll have to delve into the details of that some more i'm just curious does anybody else have uh, ideas about uh using using this podcast as a communication tool? I think that's a green light. That means you can do whatever you want with it there, Greg. <laughs> uh, I, I, would, I would actually try to I appreciate bringing in Martin. So for those of you that are in this uh, space here now, uh, it is the Yongin Kotesol uh, you know, welcome table. And so be remiss if we didn't mention Martin as a, as a past president. And at the time that I uh, came into the uh, chapter, uh, he was he, he's just uh, very involved, right? Like I remember my first impression of him was he was uh, running back and forth, getting some rope and tape to be able to hang our the chapter conference uh, a banner and make sure that the welcome table was all set up. Um, and it's been highly impressed with him ever since. And so then uh, he asks me, uh, James, I, I've got this idea for a podcast. Like, what do you think? Do you, do you, could you take it over? And so, um, Martin, can you give a little bit of insight into, you know, where you were at as far as thinking about it, how things have kind of gone um, in the, from that time until now? Uh, I've been thinking along these lines for many years. Uh, I, I uh, started a, uh, a club to, uh, to do basically what we call podcasts now in, uh, what, 1998 with some students at uh, Konyang University where I was teaching. And uh, I always wanted to sort of reproduce that. And when I joined Cotessel, I just thought it would be a really great thing to do. And so when I became president of Yongin, that was one of the things I really wanted to do. And I was really lucky <laughs> that you, James, just appeared out of nowhere to, to carry this out this thing that I really wanted to do, but never seemed to have time. And so really you were the one who, who got it started. I just had the idea. And that's, you know, that's what you, we take things and we just kind of start throwing it out there and see what happens. I, uh, I didn't know what I was doing and getting myself into. And what I did try uh, as a, as a philosophy and approach to it was I wanted to make sure that all of our members or the presenters had some kind of digital footprint that said on this date in March, I did a presentation with the Jungian chapter and I, I don't have the same kind of requirements from my university, but I know a number of other universities, um, people that are trying to apply for jobs at other places, they need to have this, this portfolio of experiences to say, this is what I've done. This is where I've done it at. And so I, that was the goal was to try and have some nuggets of information, some tidbits and uh, strategies, methods, different things that we could record. Uh, but then most importantly, how we could help those people that were doing the presentations uh, have documentation in a more uh, concrete form. 
Now, there are a few of people that kind of slipped in there and slipped out as far as uh, interviews, and Leonie was one of them. And uh, my apologies, because that, that those interviews are on my phone that, that bricked up my iPhone. And that was another thing. It's, it stayed very basic. It was six to eight minute interviews that I, I looked into um, Audacity and other uh, audio software. I was trying to research the different um, ways to be able to put it out. And it, I kind of leaned towards where Martin was at as far as it just, it wasn't enough. I didn't have enough time and it, it wasn't something that I was so passionate about that I could just really dive in. And so I think that's where it started off with an idea. I took it and I was more concerned with in reach. I really wanted to reach into the chapter and into the Cotiso, uh, uh ecosystem uh, community and see there's these really strong, awesome people that are doing these presentations for us and at our conferences. And man, let's make sure that we share that information out there. And now uh, we're at the point where there's, you know, long, more time given and taken. So I will try to unbrick that phone and make that podcast public there, Leone. There's a, there's probably a handful of other ones too that are lying in wait. <laughs> well, I, I can certainly, and actually I would be rather excited to uh, interview Leone again, you know, have to do it over, then we have to do it over. <laughs> That's got my vote. Sweet. <laughs> there we go. I, I just, and, and I don't know Leone at all, which is kind of cool uh, to come at this, but uh, she sounds like a really interesting interview. Mm. Sweet. Well, we, uh, we're into the uh, next stage of the conversation the evening. I hope that your cups are filled and whatever snacks you have going on are, are okay. Is anybody in absolute need of a break? If you, okay. Uh, Leone says a little one. Um, we're gonna, we'll give it a, a five, five minute or so break but at the same time most of us could just stay here hang out here uh i'm i'm okay with keeping the the conversation open and flowing but as far as the next stage of uh having our key uh friends with martin uh bien and david uh is a good five to seven minutes good for you fellas to finalize your preparation and then we can get started at say 805 sounds good yeah good so yeah, feel free to take a take a stretch, potty break, or otherwise, and uh, we'll see, meet you back here at eight oh five. Not cool to not know Leone. True words. Think I should pause it or just kind of keep that going? I'm going to pause it. This, this evening's. Uh, on un, conference like uh, symposium, but with no papers presented, uh, conversation and, and fun time. Uh, this virtual welcome table is brought to you by nobody, uh, but we are looking for sponsors. So if you happen to know some, send them our way. That'd be great. Um, Greg uh, with his uh, podcast would really appreciate any volunteers uh, contacting him directly uh, and please feel free to use the chat room to do that and uh, uh, give uh, ideas either publicly or directly uh, no problem um, if you know somebody else here within uh, Cotiso that you think would be a good a good fit for helping out that'd be uh, great also uh, what we are going to transition here into is this whole idea of English camps and differentiation and a lot of other interesting parts that uh, for me as a university uh, English teacher, I, I have very little contact with and understanding of what happens um, within the English camp world and how to make these things happen. So I'm glad that there's uh, the three of you that are ready to present, but not only that, like you're, 
you're kind of getting some of the theory and the research behind it as well as just what you've done the last uh, couple camp seasons so I will now be quiet and I will let Martin, uh, David, and Bien introduce themselves and tell us just what exactly they've discovered the last uh, couple camp seasons. Hi. Martin, you want to go first? Yeah. Um, I'm Martin and uh, welcome to Kids on Zoom. <laughs> uh, David Berry and uh, Bien and I. Uh, have done a few camps on Zoom. Uh, we first went to one uh, in the summer. And so we're gonna tell you uh, a little bit about how the camps operated, how they changed over time and some of the challenges that we had going through it. Um, let me just start with, where's my PowerPoint? Okay. Um, you remember last year we had this coronavirus thing that came into Korea and the schools were, while well, they were delayed and shut down and opened up again and shut, I don't know what happened in the end, but basically the, the, the net result was that summer camps for kids were canceled. And, uh, that was not surprising, but there was one uh, organization, the the one that runs the Yonsei University Kids Camp that decided to go online using Zoom. And so the Zoom camp was born. Um, I'm gonna tell you just a little bit about how a regular camp usually goes with, with kids. Uh, a lot of university people uh, tend to work in them because they're free in the summer, but I'm not sure how many people here have. Um, it's usually about two weeks or a month. It goes all day for the kids, sometimes overnight. Um, and usually you have a native speaker and a Korean teacher working together. The native speaker leads the curriculum and the activities and the Korean teacher kind of takes care of the students, assists with the, uh, the activities and acts as kind of a parental interface. They communicate with the parents, they put stuff on websites for them, or if somebody calls, then they end up talking to them. Uh, they're there all day. So uh, usually in the morning, uh, the kids, it's almost like a school. They study conversation, grammar, reading, writing, stuff like that. And uh, then in the afternoon, they do activities like maybe um, science activities or arts, art, things like that. Most of them, the kids have to write a journal. Um, and the student, or, yeah, the students eat and they socialize together. And usually there's some sort of project or presentation activity that they, they work on during all their free time as a class. And, uh, that's more or less how it goes. The Zoom camps were different. First of all, um, in the summer, it seems like the decision to actually have a Zoom camp was really a snap decision. And so uh, instead of being all day, they were just like 90 minutes a day. The class were limited to eight students, um, where usually there are, you know, up to about 15, depending on the level in a, a regular camp. It was not organized. And I don't, I wanna distinguish not organized from disorganized because it wasn't really disorganized. It just hadn't been organized at all. They had a textbook, they uh, hired a bunch of native speakers and they had a few Korean teachers kicking around for troubleshooting and to sort of monitor the classes to make sure the kids were understanding what was going on, basically. Um, the kids were meant to, to do uh, a show and tell, basically one per kid per camp. And uh, so every day there would be a different kid doing show and tell, telling about you know their hobby or something that they found interesting, anything at all. And of course they had to do journals. 
the second camp in the winter uh, was in January. We just finished it a couple of weeks ago, or there were actually two of them. So uh, we finished them a couple of weeks ago. They were still 90 minutes, still eight students, uh, still two weeks long. Um, they were a little bit more organized. Uh, they'd had more time to plan and they had feedback from the first camp and they still had a textbook, but this time they had a native speaker and a Korean teacher in every class. Uh, the students still were doing journals every day uh, and they still did the show and tell, but they also had this thing in the, in the summer, it was kind of a panic to fill the 90 minutes because the activities that usually the camp would have to, to, for the teachers to do with the kids just weren't there. But they found some for, for the winter camp, but they were offline activities. They made a calendar, they made a clock, they made worry dolls and dream catchers. Um, they actually made a little safe about this big. And they made a, a model of a solar system. And so um, both camps had 13 classes in six levels. Bien, who's gonna speak first, he was class one, which was the lowest of the low levels. Um, David uh, was class number five. And so uh, he was, it, it's almost the median class, but it's actually the lowest level in level two. And I had a completely different set of problems. I had class 13, I was the highest level. And so uh, I'm gonna ask Bien and David to, to yeah. tell about their camps. Uh, Bien will go first and David will go next, then I'll finish up. Um, if you've got any questions, you can ask after each section or at the end, if we have time. Right, so. good evening. Yeah, thanks Martin. Uh, as Martin have said, uh, I handled uh, the lowest level uh, group, and I, I'll be sharing what I felt were my my observations of of that experience. And and I think for for all of us here who have had at least some sort of camp like experience, we don't go to camps to actually learn in the traditional sense. Like we their lessons and curriculum, kids go there to have fun. You know, their parents send them, and hopefully they they speak and meet a native speaker. And one of the, just to give a context, the, the, the organizer of that camp has a kind of memorandum of agreement with the district where it belongs to. And so like they're, 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 they're contract bound to organize this camp. So they had to think of a way to go around the pandemic. And so like the, the question was, how can you make a, a fun camp for, for kids who normally have fun using face-to-face -face interactions? And that's a bigger question for me because I handle uh, beginners who are at the phonics level. I mean, they're, they're just getting over ABCs. Uh, they're, they have a hard time reading uh, words beyond three letters. And I, I have several observations that might work and might not work for others, but I hope we might find it useful for conversation tonight. So uh, I think the first one I'd like to share would be, yeah, Normally, I, I think for us, you know, uh, in, in this current era, we, we want the students to take over. We want them to participate, like the teacher takes a back seat. But uh, in the context of the camp where all, and I think Martin uh, implied this, it's a homogeneous group, like at least with respect to my group, like I'm not dealing with, uh, you know, slightly high beginner with, with a zero learner. So like everybody's a beginner. So in, in this case, uh, top-down teaching kind of works, which I, I'm sharing this because I think it's counterintuitive with probably what we've got in our training, like l let the student uh, you know, speak up and participate, but especially in an online context where like, it's harder to convey body language, it's harder to do class management, like you really have to like, I don't know if this is the right word to say, like herd them together, like everybody say, or like, or John, you say next, or Mary, you say thereafter. So uh, I found it, it, it worked because without it, uh, uh, I, I think for teachers, especially new to online teaching, like 
how do you organize? How do you how do you control it? Like we're all familiar with standing in front of the classroom, and we have this kind of like for us with enough experience, like this instinctive sense of okay, I know how to run this class. But you're looking at a screen, and everybody is a, is a moving image. How do you do that? So, for for my experience, like if the teacher has a you know has a has a um, a lesson plan that it details what the kids would do that that helps and that that ties up to to my second point since I'm, i've been dealing with beginners um and you know they, they can't communicate if you if you ask them like do you have a question um that will fly over their heads or like are you done we had to teach them that expression i'm done not yet they're they're at the level so as martin mentioned there's a native speaker to assist to to act as a bridge to translate what I'm saying to, to them. Uh, but there are cases where, like in the in the previous or first uh, online camp, the, the Korean uh, teacher only stayed for a week. And the next two weeks, there was, it's just us. So uh, um, again, it, there's a debate whether should we use Korean in class, at least for beginner ones and then online, it's a must. I think all of us here who are at least based in Korea use Papago as an online translation software on our phones and computers. That's 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 a lifesaver. Like without it, I, I, I don't think I could have run my class or even got hired for the next camp because uh, it would just be impossible. I, I'm, I'm, I'm stressing this point because we've met probably parents or teachers who say, please don't speak Korean, please speak only English. But I think in an online beginner level type, uh, L1 is a resource that should be used. Um, Martin mentioned the the safe, the the solar systems, and all that. So um, I, I think in this case, uh, again, this is speaking in terms of um, of uh, uh, how can I say um, camp. I'm not talking about former school or or hug ones, but having project work or crafts does lighten up the pressure to participate in class because as you can imagine this is a global thing a kid will be sitting in front of the monitor sometimes there's a mom there or not but they have to be exposed and looking at the screen and so like there there has to be a way to alleviate that 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 intensity so uh but as a caveat the projects were done individually like we, we couldn't say okay john jack you you do the worry doll on the side but you know it's not they're they're in, in separate locations but even though it was individually done uh i think it, it kind of helped to add spice in the in the experience of the kids i'm just gonna rush it so to give the floor to david um various teaching materials work it, it should be there and another one is Familiarity with educational uh, websites, like for those who are familiar with Canva, uh, what, uh, Martin, what's the name of that scoring uh, website that was recommended to us prior? I forgot that. You 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 grade the kids with monster stickers. You didn't use that. I didn't use that either. Uh, Pinterest. Uh, just I feel like relying on a textbook uh, would be impossible in in an online class with beginners. Like. Your material is on the net, and there are websites out there, and then we could actually do share screen. Uh, yeah, Classroom Dojo. Yeah, for those who are familiar, Classroom Dojo. And so I'm, I'm saying this like um, if, if, if we've seen the movie, the old movie Minority Report, where Tom Cruise is sliding some, you know, some kind of screen and all that, uh, you know, um, it kind of works that way, you know. You 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 have these several tabs open in your in your laptop, and then you're doing a reading material. Then you want to shift to a video in YouTube, and then do a share screen of a picture comparison in Pinterest. Like, it's out there. Use it. It it adds variety to the class, and it somehow simulates uh, the sense of like active pace of teaching that we have in face-to-face -face classroom. But as I've said, Martin said, it's a two-week experience. I, I don't want to say this would apply for, uh, you know, a regular school with four, uh, well, two months or three months. And so with that, uh, I, I pass the floor to David. David? All right. Yeah, I'm, can everyone hear me? I'll, I'll remove my share screen. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's great. So, Jan, can you hear me okay? Yeah, sure. Sure. Loud and clear, man. Okay. That's good. Okay. Well, I'm David Barry or on David, David Malcolm on the Facebook um, Cotiso site because I don't trust Facebook for privacy issues. 
Um, at any rate, I'm David Perry, so I'm here to share uh, a different angle from uh, my colleague Jan and Martin. So I'm, I would like to share what I've experienced in this uh, Zoom, Zoom uh, in this Zoom camp. And so I will hopefully be able to share. Come back, man. Uh, set that up. Uh, right. So yeah. So I will share my screen. Right. Oh, I'm not sure about that. I'll share this one. Just one like a little bit of uh, background and some a couple other people's space. Can uh, everybody turn off their microphones for a moment? Okay. I'll, uh, yeah, we need to host these. To, can the host turn off everybody okay can the host turn off all mics can host mute everybody and then we can each of us can unmute ourselves Okay, well, I'm going to. Start. Unfortunately, the host had muted himself and was also trying to search a couple other things. But yes, I should be able to do that. <laughs> Just a right. Moment. Well, yeah, that's cool. Okay, well, I'll start. Oh, yeah. Sorry, my background is a little. I should change that. Yeah, this is my background. I don't want to go to a teacher's meeting. I just put my background up. Um, anyway, so. Let's see now, you can see this one. Okay, so this is my presentation. Um, so today, okay, how do we present this? Check this out. Okay. Uh, so this is the presentation that's coming up. Okay, so yeah, my talk is online camp experience. And right, so this is a, a Zoom class, as, Mark, as uh, Bian mentioned, that this is my, I'll try to freak you guys out here. Sorry about the background. Anyway, so this is my Zoom class. This is the interface, as Bian mentioned, where interface was kind of your interface challenge. We were, we were encountered, we were supposed to teach English through uh, screen to screen technology, uh, not knowledge. Knowledge you can do screen to screen. My daughter is in high school using the, the Acellus Academy from Missouri. So it worked fine, but not for skills, not for language skills. Um, so, but you know, uh, if I just may, may um, this is what we, to administer the class, we used uh, the band where they posted their journals. And as um, uh, Bian mentioned, this is the uh, class dojo interface that we used. And so these are all the examples, example names. And so kids would earn points. So I would, you know, to administer the class, to keep people engaged, kids would be given points based on their behavior and their participation and answering other questions, breakout room behavior. And so the teacher's job was to collect those points. And then this is the um, uh, textbook. And as Bjorn mentioned, I don't know why I'm referring to Bjorn so much, but he needs to be referred to. So uh, I tell you, it looks like someone needs to be referred to. Okay, anyway, so this is our online textbook. And uh, this is one I use. It's a standard, right? It's modern. It's not your let's go from like 30 years ago. It's actually an up-to-date one. And uh, it, was, it was dry face-to-face, -face, but even drier on, online. So to, to spice it up, we used uh, things such as this. 
we used the uh, bamboozle to as a, as a way to engage the children and make them uh, make them interested in what they were they were learning uh, because otherwise they, they would be disengaged. So uh, I think that it's sort of like an online bingo. Does anyone use this? No, I'm just a solo on this one. Okay, I always solo. Even though and I'm there, we, I feel uh, I'm still uh, solo. Maybe if you throw it into the chat room, you can do some answers there. For me personally. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, and uh, another one that was really good was, this is an example uh, of uh, this was just an example that I copied from Google. I didn't use this one. I, I, I didn't keep a screenshot of the ones I used, but this is another one. Uh, all the kids had to sign up and to the quizzes, and it was a way that they could integrate what they are learning into kind of a game, gamification. That's my, if you know one of that's my big thing, is if, if you know what I'm interested in, it's digital based learning and. Uh, digital game-based learning and gamification. So this is a good way to gamify. Gamify means to uh, take a game element into a non-game, I mean, take a game element into a non-game environment, such as a quiz, right? You don't normally think of quiz as a game, but it's, you know, that, that kind of thing. So you're making a game element and the kids see some, uh, you know, lights and funny sounds and things to uh, make the uh, interface more exciting. And lastly, this is where I presented. Maybe you, some of you, have come to my presentation. This is my uh, my uh, war horse. War horse. I always drag this out at every presentation. So sorry if you've heard me dr drone on about this. But I think Space Team ESL is an excellent activity, and the kids really enjoyed. They were begging for this and Kahoot. The Kahoot and this are both kind of a game, game of gamification of this is more of a game, a pure, pure game, but Kahoot is more of a gamification. So this was something which it takes a, a bit to set up, right? The teacher has to go to the Space Team ESL uh, website and input the vocabulary set that he's teaching, he or she's teaching. So I did that and then you need to input the uh, different parts of speech and such a compound adjective and so on. And then you get adjective and you can see the control names and I won't go into the game in great detail. You can ask me about it later. Um, so this is one game that was really a good way to uh, invoke, uh, uh, make them engage. But some parents were a little leery about it because it looked too much. This game is based on a uh, entertainment, a commercial off the shelf game, which, um, but it was modified by a, a guy I know from a university in Canada. And um, so it does, it's not a serious game. It is still an entertainment game, but it, it has, uh, you can call it a game that has um, entertainment game interface. Uh, there's no obvious pedagogical, it does not have any obvious pedagogical value to it, right? Because the user did not want to make another one of these serious games that falls flat on its face. You know, there's so many serious games which are totally, you know, not only are they not fun, but they don't really help anyone learn. So we want to, uh, the author, the author um, of this game, Henry Smith from, um, anyway, from Henry Smith from, uh, from Montreal, he wanted to create a game which uh, appeared to be uh, a commercial off the shelf game, but had a, uh, Kind of a hidden, sorry, he, as he put it, um, uh, serious game in in in, in appearance. Uh, sorry, entertainment game in appearance, but in spirit, a um, commercial off the shelf. Uh, uh, sorry, um, in spirit, a, um, um, a serious game. So it had pedagogical principles kind of underneath the surface. So that was uh, something we did. It take a bit of setup. Right, and you had to get the kids to download the uh, this app, the space space team app, and get it installed and and get it set up. But I had a Korean teacher, so we could do that very nicely. And once we did install it, um, they were really interested in it, and 
it was engaged. So we, I put them into breakout rooms in Zoom and had them work together like a pair. Usually a pair is enough to play this game, sometimes trios if, or triads if it was really. So anyway, that's, I could go on, but I won't. Uh, Kahoot, as I mentioned, is another more gamification um, activity, a uh, digital, digital kind of game that we, that we use. And, you know, maybe other people have used it and they, they like that. A little, little more uh, easier. There's not as much, uh, Space Team has more of a learning curve because they have to get used to the, the whole concept of the game they have to get used to. Whereas Kusud is more um, a very small learning curve and is uh, quite simple. So actually it, it took a bit of selling. I think it was kind of a sales pitch of a space team, ESL. And this one, Kahoot was more, uh, didn't require any convincing. So this game, uh, you know, it, it was good for, for vocabulary. Mostly I used it for vocabulary and some sentence structures, sentences. And um, then we, we also use Canva, which um, is, we had one student who left, Juliet. Of course, there's always a Juliet in every kid's class. And she left, so we, each student was, it was kind of a project-based learning where students um, made, the pro made this poster on, on the thing. So uh, Beyond mentioned that we did some uh, craft, which was sort of a, we attempt busy with a time killer, I felt, but we had to do a craft online, which was rather not the most productive use of the time. I think Canva is a better substitute for that. It's more of a something which is designed for a face to, uh, for screen to screen. And uh, then a few others that I used once or twice was picked in uh, making comics from some kids they could choose the characters. I, these are what I just Googled. I didn't keep the ones they had made, fortunately. Uh, but these are just Googled. Um, but this is a thing. Children would choose a character from the uh, collection on the website and then make the little characters and uh, dialogue so they could produce sentences. And so it was kind of more program uh, uh, task-based. Uh, learning there. And then YouTube was uh, entertainment, kind of. This is a website that was another thing we used. I think that was, oh yeah, Jamboard was another, sorry, I, I'm giving you the technical stuff. So, so this was breakout rooms, more more of that uh, task-based where they each group had to create a picture using the vocabulary of the, the lesson. And they, they do that. And uh, that was really motivating for them. And then little things we used. And uh, this is a list of activities that you can use. So those were always kind of your bread and butter activities for uh, children's uh, online learning scenario. And that's, that's about it for me. Uh, this is a kind of a technical overview because I think that that's what would be, I, this is what I could most value I could add to this presentation. So are there any, I think that's about it. So are there any questions for, for what I've said in the last 15 minutes? <clears throat> David, I think there's an inquiry in the chat group where asking about if Pixton is uh, a paid service or uh, or how much of the free version uh, it was used in your class? What extend? Yeah, Pixton, the the comic, the comic. Oh yeah, uh, it is. It says yeah, everything else is free. I mean, quizzes is 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 free also. Quite a lot of it free. You can get the paid version, but most yeah, quizzes is totally free. Face team is is free, uh, but uh, I think Henry likes to have people pay something because he's he's an independent. He's an indie game designer. He left. Sleeping Beast Company. But Pixton is not like quizzes. Pixton is you can't actually do that much with old paying. So all you can do is make your basic little cartoon. And that's and you can't even really save that. Uh, or nor really do anything with it. 
like Canva, in contrast, you can download something you create and uh, you can do a lot of Canva for free, but Pixton, you can't really do it unless you jailbreak it, I suppose, if you're so inclined. But I encourage everyone to, so I, I personally am not a comic book fan. I'm more of a game fan. I see the great value of games. So I didn't really use Pixton that much for that reason. But I think, in my opinion, the most valuable and most popular was the games, the, the Space Team ESL and the uh, Kahoot. All right. Well, I see a couple of people have uh, have also joined us. Uh, Melvin, welcome, and uh, David. Hello, greetings. Another David. We got a yeah, few right. people in here in the in the session. Uh, what I think would be helpful if you all are in agreement with this is to uh, move into some breakout rooms for uh, you know maybe a five a ten minute session. Uh, before we do that, I'm going to first get a kind of a general group feel uh any comments feedbacks if it if i hear uh silence and chirping uh then i then i'm going to assume that it's probably good to get the groups down into maybe uh three or four people uh <clears throat> i do know that martin has a few more things to share uh just as a heads up the the thinking about the groups would be that uh, you know that there's the, the different topics that we've gone on the podcasting uh, maybe it's the levels within those uh, camps and then the other reality is this is a open-ended anything goes session and so we do have uh, the option of uh, listening to Martin and we're going to give him that that a little bit more time just to kind of give us some things to think about, but then we'll move into some breakout rooms and the topics will be of your choosing. So Martin, go ahead. Uh, hi, I promised you that I'd uh, tell you about my class, class 13, which was a lot different from the other ones. And where's my PowerPoint? It's kind of disappeared. I don't know where it went. Okay, I will. I can share the screen. I can. Oh, can you see? Ah, there it is. Okay. Um, so I was in like the, the most advanced class. Um, uh, I had several classes. They were all the most advanced class in the camp that they were in. Uh, one of them had kids, several kids who could have been mistaken for native speakers. Um, and so I had a few things that were just not issues at all. Um, language issues, uh, I never had any problem with people not understanding me. I, I, I did one time and out of, um, I don't know, like four camps, that's the only time I, I had a problem. Uh, I never had a problem with people wanting to speak Korean instead of English. Uh, after the camp, one of my kids confessed that she had done it when she was working on one of the projects or maybe several, but uh, I was in and out of the breakout rooms we were using. I didn't see anyone do it. So I think she might've done it during some of the group homework that we did. Um, we never had tech problems. Most of the kids were a little older than were in Bien's and David's classes. And so like the students could use the tech. Uh, they knew how to use Zoom. They uh, caught on to anything that I introduced them to pretty quickly. And if they had a problem, they could troubleshoot it, it themselves at least to the extent where they would be able to uh, get it working kind of or enough. And then they could hit their parents up later to to fix it. So uh, I never had that kind of problem. I also never had problems with like parents or families being in the way. Um, I had one girl in one of my uh, camp classes who, who wrote me after that she'd done this particular class from a hotel somewhere. Her family had traveled and uh, so she was in a completely different environment. Nobody noticed. 
um, her parents and her brother just stayed in another room. They were quiet. And so my objectives were to have them speaking English and to make it as much like a camp as possible, meaning I wanted it to be lots of fun and I wanted them to be able to socialize and make friends. I wanted class cohesion to, uh, to be there. Um, I decided I wanted to do as little book as possible and I wanted to encourage talking, uh, mostly through projects um, and do a lot of class, class activities. Um, I'm gonna sort of skip over a lot of the first part. I tried to run the first camp as, an off, as I would an offline camp. And I've done a lot of offline camps, so I figured I could do it. But by about Wednesday, I was thinking maybe I needed to take another strategy because um, the kids thought most of the things we were doing were fun. We weren't getting very much in the way of class cohesion. And so as a, a sort of reboot, I decided I wanted to do a lot of group-based stuff. So every chance I had after that, I had them in breakout rooms. Um, I already had several things planned, but I just, anything I could at that point. Um, I wanted to increase their bonding. I wanted to, there was a risk that they might speak Korean, but as I mentioned before, that never materialized that I was aware of. Um, I also increased the homework, which sounds counterintuitive when you're talking about a camp, but um, these classes were 90 minutes long. In a camp, kids spend like six or eight hours a day together and they, they weren't being able to bond because they had no time together. And I also got the students working together as much as possible while they were doing their homework. And uh, I also, had them like talk to each other so that at the beginning of every class, I would pick just like two or three people and ask them what other people had done the day before since the last class. And these things helped. Um, I still don't think they had as much of a bonding experience as they would have in an offline camp, but I think it worked. Um, the DIYs, the physical projects they did, like the calendar, clock, making worry dolls and stuff, I actually found that the, the stuff I was doing online worked better. The stuff that we sort of came up with out of our heads as we, you know, when there was no organization, worked better than the stuff where the kids had to or were able to use their hand to build stuff because most of that stuff, it was just individual stuff. And a lot of the, not parents from my class, but parents from other classes complained about uh, the kids not doing anything in English while they were doing these. Um, I sort of ant anticipated that and got around it by when I introduced a new project I started by telling some kind of story or getting them to think about it somehow. I guess kind of like you do in a normal class, but I got them, I showed them different kinds of numbers they could put on a clock. Or we talked about holidays when we were doing a, uh, a calendar. Um, and it worked most of the time, except for when they built a safe, that was just so difficult. And so kind of weird, <laughs> basically we just got into that as fast as we could and they barely got enough done to complete it after class. And that's the other thing. Most of those projects were completed after the class finished, after the camp finished for the day. 
and the students went off and finished it on their own or with their parents in Korean. Um, but I did get them to present it the next day. Um, they it took maybe 10 minutes at the beginning of class, but they were able to show what they'd done the day before, maybe tell a bit about it, but at least have the other students see, see what they did. I also found those were kind of a lot of work for me because I had to go and prepare for them a lot more than I would have if I was doing an offline camp. On the other hand, the online posters, um, I just put them into groups, gave them the idea. Uh, at first, I had to uh, demo uh, Canva because they were all done in Canva, um, but they were able to use that over and over again. So. Um, we did posters first, and then they did some videos. Uh, they made video stories. And, you know, videos are a little different from posters, so I had to do a little bit of, of uh, instruction at the beginning, but it was at a minimum. And so most of the time, the kids were in a breakout room, they were doing stuff together, and they were using their imaginations. They were coming up with new ideas and figuring out how they could do stuff. And so I find found that the online pro projects were a lot better. Um, they forced them to cooperate and to talk to each other. Um, and I found the teams often did extra stuff after class and, and they would come the next day or write in their journals about how they were up until 11 o'clock with, um, with their classmates doing this project and then they'd finish up by saying it was, we had so much fun. Um, so it did work. Um, the other thing that I wanted to just cover was how I made the groups, because I think that's important in Zoom. Uh, for the first camps, I did just repeated random groups. Whenever I started a new project or a new thing with them, I picked the randomized group and uh, Zoom came up with random groups. And that was easy, it was convenient, it worked. And, but the students didn't really get to know anyone well. Um, on the other hand, they got to talk to almost everybody during some project or other. Uh, when I did the winter camps, then we had like one planned group that the Korean teacher and I got together and we chose groups based on the kids English ability and leadership skills. Um, and that increased group and class cohesion, but I, they only got to know two people well, which doesn't sound so bad, but when uh, in the summer, there was, there were two students who like late in the camp when they suddenly were working together, they discovered that they lived just across the road from each other. Um, one of them had just moved there in, in the past couple of months. They hadn't been able to go to school really. And so she didn't know anybody in the area. And suddenly these two people connected. The other girl, her best friend had just moved away. And so they really clicked and came together. And that probably wouldn't have happened if we had been doing just one planned group for the entire camp. Um, the other sort of risk there is uh, we had to make the groups after the first day. And so we were really guessing on English ability with limited information and especially leadership skills. and. There were a couple of students that we got a little bit wrong. Now, it didn't cause a disaster, but we probably would have made different groups if we'd had more information at the beginning. So for the camp, for the um, older classes, no, more advanced classes, I would make some recommendations. First of all, and I know I'm not the only person who suggested this, um, more time. That means longer classes and a longer camp. Um, the, the offline camps have like six or eight hours a day for these kids to work together and bond and create class cohesion. But um, 
these guys were together for an hour and a half for 10 days. Um, it would also allow for a bigger variety of activities. We didn't use the book very much, but there were a couple of book topics, which even though I didn't do very much in the book, the students were really excited by. Um, they really loved making their own superheroes, which was my activity, but it was based on the theme or the stuff that was in the book for that chapter. Um, they were really interested in saving the world, which was the environmentalist, environmentalism chapter. Um, and, and so it would have given us more of a chance to, to sort of take some of these topics and run with them or try different things or some of the things that maybe we didn't want to do as a core activity, but the kids could have lots of fun with them anyway. Uh, I'm thinking of a listening exercise that I, I do in a lot of my classes. I just play a song, the students tell me the words, it's a lot of fun. When I tried it in the first class, it was a lot of fun, but really there was no class bonding going on there. And so uh, the students, they, they wrote in their journal stuff like, yeah, we got to listen to a song and tell the teacher what the words were. Um, so they really enjoyed it, but I felt that they didn't really accomplish very much in, the, in terms of socialization. Um, I would recommend doing online projects rather than offline. And because I'm recommending more time, rotate the teachers so that they're not forced to have the same teacher for an hour and a half is okay. But if you're doing like three hours, maybe that's a little bit much. And of course, to use small groups as much as possible. So I think you can see that my experience was a lot different from especially Bien's experience, but also David's experience. Um, the three levels and probably teaching styles as well made a lot of difference in, in how we were, how we did the camp and uh, what we were able to, to accomplish and yeah, how. And so that's the end of the talk. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, so the, as we, as I mentioned before, do, we'll do a little bit of a full group. If there's things that like everybody can, can benefit from with your question, please, uh, or immediate observation. And then uh, at about the nine o'clock time, I was figuring to be able to get into groups of three, uh, maybe four, it looks like there's uh, 14 people here. So, um, so yeah. What do you think? Where, where are you at with those different camps? Uh, thank you for the people that were commenting along. Um, questions that seem to, to resonate um, were just how, you know, how are you dealing with and for everybody, but especially when David was presenting a lot of his resources there, um, you know, the, the implementation of that. So um, I'll stop talking now and ask, the same question that Martin just asked. Do you have any questions? <laughs> yeah, I've got one. Um, for all three of you, really, uh, do you think right at the end, Martin mentioned that maybe rotating teachers would have been an interesting idea. Um, do you think that would have benefited your students and would you as a teacher have liked to have been with a group other than the one you were working with at that time? Or do you think being with the same group for the two weeks facilitated social bonding between them and you? I, I think it did. And for an hour and a half a day, I would not recommend rotating teachers. Um, I would only recommend it for like a long time. Um, the, I, the main benefit I think that would come from that is it would just help uh, make it a little less, I, 
I don't know how to say it, a little less boring. I, I don't think it was boring, but I think after a while, if we put another hour and a half on top, it might get a little strained for some of the students. Um, they had a lot of fun, but the same person, the same activities, the same everything for three hours is a, a little bit long for a kid. Yeah, my David, take, my, do you yeah, have any? Yeah, my, my take there is, I think within the camp context, I think staying with, with especially for beginners, uh, the, 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 the main role of the Korean teacher is to step in when uh, L1, L2 translation is needed. And I, 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 I couldn't speak Korean to save my life. So like I have to rely on the Korean teacher to do that for me. And because you're managing a, a, a group, uh, eight or nine, or in my, in my case, they were, they were 10, uh, you know, you, you're looking at this one kid preparing this material. So like you need someone with the sense enough on when uh, he or she would step in. Okay, let me, let me handle that part. Let me translate that part. So I, I think that kind of dynamics between co-teachers in a co-teaching setup uh, gets better over time. So staying together would actually uh, benefit. But that's on the assumption that your co-teacher wants to work well with you. There, there are also cases like your synergy is all over the place, like the way the philosophy of teaching is different. So I think that would be good to 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 change, but that would be more of a logistical issue, a, 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 a philosophy issue. But like this co-teaching per se, I, I, I'm all for like stick together, at least for the for the, the period of the camp. Uh, David? David is... Okay, it does not. I thought it was him. Uh, well, David's traveling, so he may have had to to leave. Transfer to a different table. Uh, it looks like he's still there, but uh, um, in the chat room, he did say bye. But then, oh, uh, yes, I do see his screen still there. So we will. Oh, okay. Welcome him back. And um, anybody else would like to speak to Leone's question and or how they've maybe experienced that in their given situations. Um. I, I do have a question though, if it's if it's all right. I, I wonder who among us here have had uh, similar, like not, not a camp, but you've been handling uh, a majority of your teaching load online. Is it all of us here? Probably. Okay. I, the reason I ask this is because, like, I, I'm just, I think we're just working on the assumption, like, we're we're all doing online, <laughs> and then, like, you know, just there's a shared experience for all of us. So if that's the case, then that's good. I'm sort of interested. How many people have done like camps, English camps for kids? Um. Well, I used to do a lot of English camps for the kids in Wasong when I was still there. But online, no, no, I haven't done the online version. But um, face to face, um, and there it was really a question of, you know, five, six hours a day of me and the kids being together. So that's why I asked, you know, would it facilitate changing it up? Because I think there were times that they got a little bit sick of me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said, yeah. no, I got a little bit sick of them at times. <laughs> but, most uh, most yeah. of the camps I worked at offline, uh, as you said, they go like the whole day. And so the kids weren't with one teacher. They would... Uh, in the morning, they'd have like a different teacher for each class. Um, and then in the uh, afternoon, like one teacher would do one activity for several days and take it into all the different classes. And so they got to see everybody eventually. Yeah, I think I think my most successful camp and I certainly was always in the situation where I would have to fill all five or six hours a day myself. Wow. I mean, there was just, 
There was just nobody else stepping up to it. That's exactly. Um, and um, my most successful camp was printing out from a website that a guy in Germany had designed the papercraft version of the Hogwarts campus. <laughs> nice. it, was wow. something, it was something like uh, nice. 56 pages, 56 A4 pages, <clears throat> all numbered and colored and, and what have you. And we started at the beginning of the two weeks with each, with first of all, making them into groups and then giving each group a part of the campus to do. And we would start in the morning with talking about stuff that happens in that part of the campus. Oh, well, here's where they sleep. Here's where they eat. Here's where they can walk around outside. Here's where they have their classes and things like that. And then um, we would start and there'd be a lot of cutting and a lot of glue and a lot of arguing about, yeah, this one goes with that one. And I would sort of loosely walk between the different groups and lend a hand when they got into real problems, but then have like a 15 minute chat with them. How do you think it's shaping up? Is it starting to look like what you see in the movies? Uh, is it difficult? Is it easy? And then move to the next one. And then after about an hour of cutting and pasting and what have you, we'd take a break and we'd go outside onto the playground and we'd play Quidditch or uh, <laughs> for, for like, uh, 30 minutes and then come back inside, have our snacks and then get back to the cutting and pasting. And at the end of it, we had uh, photos with my group and the Hogwarts campus. Not complete, not complete, <laughs> but certainly <laughs> the point where you could recognize it. So um, that was that was a good one. What level were they? Oh, I had uh, that was at a middle school, and I had mm. some students. Uh, it was in a rural area, so some students with almost no English ability, and some students almost at fluent native speaker level. Wow. And mm -hmm. so in the groups, I made sure to have at least one fluent speaker in each group. Um, can, can I comment about just what Leone shared? Uh, I, I think that's a, a, a pretty good example where we have all of these effective um, um, approaches in, in, in our offline, uh, uh, I like to say offline analog classes. And I think the question now that rises for both teachers and students is, how much of those is transferable in the online setting? As what Martin said a while ago, like at the beginning, you know, you want to run it as what you probably used to. And then you come across factors where it's just not clicking. So I, I for me, I mean, I, I highlight that point because I do miss face-to-face -face interactions. Like there's just this spontaneity and electric feeling that, you know, the, the class comes alive on its own. Because that's the power of nonverbals and face-to-face -face interactions. But how, how do we, the question for me is, do, is the question, do I transfer that in, in the online setting or are there entirely different rules for, for online teaching so that uh, by abandoning the old paradigm and uh, adapting a new one, which I don't know what that would be, uh, we would be able to use more. Uh, online teaching better uh, accept accept its limitations and harness more its potential. But I, I that was just beautiful because I, I'm a Hogwarts fan. I, I'm a Harry Potter head. You know, I love that. I'd love to do that with my kids. But I mean, I if I if I get that, do I buy a Hogwarts like diorama per kid in each house so we could simulate the feeling because we can't be together in the same classroom? So yeah, I just wanted to just point that out, James. Okay. My, my suggestion, I mean, these days I'm teaching here in Bulgaria 
for an organization called Cabinata. And I have students ranging from sort of high school level up to being a full professor at one of the universities. Uh, that's, that's my range that I'm wow. working with. And um, one of the things that I have found that actually transfers is like, for example, this idea now of, of the Hogwarts. What you can do is, um, I think that site, I must have a look for that site again. But I think on that site, you had the option of actually only printing out, say, like the, the main hall or the bridge or mm -hmm. whatever. If you gave your students the thing of, okay, print out just this, and it's a free site. You're not paying for printing it out. So all they're going to pay for is the printing costs. And you say to them, okay, so you're going to print out the bridge and build the bridge. You're going to print out the main hall and build the main hall. You're going to print out whatever. And we're going to show each other our, our construction that we're doing. As Martin was saying, a lot of the construction work that he did was happening offline. So that would be the flipped classroom sort of thing. Here's what I'm giving you. You're doing it in your own time. And then in the classroom, you're presenting to us the difficulties you had with putting this together. Um, what is this space being used for in the Hogwarts universe? Um, who's your favorite character in that particular space? Um, things like that. Just an idea. You would uh, characterize that as flipped constructivism. <laughs> Sorry, pedagogy. Sounds good to me. <laughs> We're going to theory. Uh, um, and to be to your point, I think the, the, the passion that you have is definitely, that's going to carry things through you know, analog, digital, and whatever decisions yeah. that you make. And, and I, the last, go ahead. I think this is what, what, what you just said, that one of the comments and one of the pieces of feedback I keep getting, it doesn't matter whether I uh, do a lesson where I present them with 20 pictures of South Africa and say to them, say what you see. What do you see in this picture? How does it make you feel? Would you like to be there? Or whether I get them to respond in IELTS fashion to a topic, describe your favorite hobby, tell us what it is, where you do it, you know, those kinds of things. It doesn't matter what I'm doing. I've, I've done grammar lessons with them about past participles and stuff like that. Doesn't matter what I'm doing. At the end, the feedback that comes back to me is, teacher, that was so much fun. You really like this. And because you like it, we like it. And I think that's the secret. Doesn't matter what you're doing with the students. If you like it, they're going to like it. And then, so then what I was also going to uh, point out, Bien, is that I feel like moving ahead, we're going to have so much data on students. And it's not that we don't have that now, but now it's more anecdotal and observational things that yeah. we don't, we, we kind of intuitively space people apart, or we know that this kid is, is having a bad day or a good day or whatever, so that they're gonna work in this group well or not. But I think being that much more intentional about these two students are stronger students and I really want them to work together to strengthen themselves for that reason versus, mm -hmm. oh, I want them to both go off to the two not so strong students and be the, the tutor guide in the breakout room or whatever, I think, Thinking through that is going to be our right. task and more so than in the past. So, yeah. Hey, all right, David, are you, you definitely can't stick around. Are you, you're heading out. 
Uh, and you can feel free to answer that one. I think for us here, I was going to give us another uh, eight to 10 minutes of, of breakout room time where we're, we're in uh, group uh, pairs or, yeah, I think pairs because we're now down to 10 that are active. <laughs> we can just all stay here if we want to. Yeah, but it's I know. Enough. I know Adela and I've gotten to know uh, Ronnie a little bit and I, I do want to give them a chance just to kind of interact with some people and uh, I, if everybody it's I'll put it in that let the participants choose a room and if you float back here then we'll know how that <laughs> <laughs> So I'm gonna create four breakout rooms, uh, right. recently, uh, or it says let the uh, assign automatically, and then I'll change it to let the participants choose a room. So that's how we'll go. Three, two, one. See you in a moment. Yeah. Open rooms. All right. Well, here we are, and the uh, breakout rooms are happening for maybe another six more minutes. Uh, this part of the recording might actually get just cut off. We'll see how it works out. But the whole idea and hope of having uh, time together in a, in a virtual welcome table, uh, I hope has been something that was um, an interesting uh, listening or watch for you. Uh, the idea was certainly to um, have uh, a relaxed space and, and offering that was still kind of uh, you know, full of good content, full of good information that could be helpful for you, especially with our speakers talking about the camps. Um, we hope that if you're organizing a camp or you're part of a camp, uh, that is upcoming that that's helpful information for you. Certainly with the Yongi chapter podcast, we do want to encourage you to consider uh, contributing uh, your ideas, your, uh, your voice, your experience. Uh, that those are all very valuable things. And we want to uh, encourage that. We want to identify that and say that it's a, 
not only uh, benefit to you and to your students and to your environment, but um, I think it's something that is worth sharing with others. And maybe you just want to grow in your uh, podcasting or um, writing and planning and organizing. Uh, you know, maybe you don't want to be on the microphone and in front of a camera, but you do enjoy uh, putting the puzzle together and piecing those things together so that it's a smooth operation all together. And uh, we would appreciate that. We want to uh, help you grow if it's an area you're not familiar with or to take full advantage of uh, the skills and abilities and experience that you already bring to uh, the, uh, this time and space. Now, it's very possible that we're watching this a year on. Uh, right now it is February 2021, but who knows how long this video is going to be sticking around. And we do want you to think about like what was happening at this time uh, here in Korea and around the world and how it is that we have uh, taken all of our time, our effort and energy up until this point to be trained professionals, uh, even if at the uh, very minimum of somebody having gone to college and, and work experience in a totally different field. And then I jumped over into teaching English as a foreign language and, and teaching to speakers of other languages um, to the people that were from the get-go, they knew I want to be a English as a foreign language speaker uh, and, and teacher to those speakers of other languages. So uh, we appreciate you for being here as a part of this space and part of this community. Uh, even if you don't reply in the comments below or offer any kind of ideas to the people that were in this uh, space, and we do want you to know that your contributions are uh, going to make a difference. And we thank you for how you are inspiring and being passionate and, and helping those students that are given to your care. Uh, it's really important. It's really necessary. And uh, if somebody hasn't told you thank you in a, a day or a week or so, uh, I want to say that. Thank you. Thank you for the, what you are uh, giving up. Uh, thank you for what you are giving energy to, and that's really, really important. So, uh, again, this is uh, a beginning of a year. It's February now, but it's going to be March soon, and we do desire to have a very full 2021, and so we encourage you to consider being a speaker. Uh, do you want to do a presentation? that is more academic in nature and uh, full of references to other resources, to uh, educators and, and leaders and other ways of demonstrating a more theoretical uh, approach to these uh, teaching opportunities. Or maybe you just have a, a few quick, like, oh, this is a great, a uh, way to be able to close out a class just before the weekend starts or these practical tips that are really, really helpful. How do you get people uh, refocused on a Monday morning? That's, those are very helpful tips and ideas. And sometimes they include technology. Other times they include, uh, you know, just using the, the realia that you have available um, and that you are encouraging the students on the other side of this, uh, this computer. And uh, hopefully by the time you're watching this video, it is more uh, of a situation where face-to-face -face is the, the norm and doing uh, video conferencing and, and online digital teaching is an intentional way to be able to do it what better and, and do instruction well and a way to address, you know, just a few kids being sick rather than a whole class uh, having to try and be safe because of uh, coronavirus or other different things that are out there. So uh, what can you do in the meantime? If you're not a member already, I 
hopefully uh, I recommend that you join the Yongin chapter, uh, but maybe you have a local chapter closer to you somewhere else and uh, certainly uh, feel free to join up with them. Uh, consider paying attention to our uh, special interest groups known as the SIGs. Uh, they are focused on areas of uh, expertise and specialization. And so we encourage you to, to pursue those. And hopefully uh, throughout the course of this year, you find a home, you find a place where you are encouraged and people are able to uh, benefit from your story, benefit from your experience. So I'm gonna go ahead and reach out to the people that are in those breakout rooms now and encourage them to come on back. And uh, in the meantime, I'm gonna go ahead and just pause the video for a moment. So, <clears throat> and I think Yong, we have Yongin chapter executives here. So I've shared this as, this as well with you as, as well. I think there's only a couple of people that don't really know the things that I'm going to introduce. I'm going to just show you uh, maybe two or three things uh, that I, I found very useful. Uh, one of the David, things- may I ask, should, you know what, since I, it, I put it back to be recording, but do you think, should, should it continue with recording? I think this is good stuff. No, and, okay. it's not really that good stuff. All right, well, if you really want to know and you're watching this video, you need to contact David directly or come to the Yongin chapter executive meetings. Uh, until yeah. then, we're going to pause the recording for the moment. For the moment. Okay. Well, folks, uh, we are now to the close of the virtual welcome table and, and symposium. We're very thankful for our presenters and for the people that have contributed great questions and ideas. Uh, this was meant to be kind of a, a little bit past the beginning of the conference, but still uh, with four or five more days left of great content, uh, really build momentum. And we do hope that you feel welcomed. We do want to hear your voice. You are a teacher that is helping other teachers and we do hope that we have helped you. So uh, with that, on behalf of the Yongin chapter, I'm going to say thank you for tuning in. And if you have any questions, thoughts, ideas, please uh, feel free to reach out to us, send an email, uh, catch us on uh, social media with uh, Facebook, as well as um, we don't have a Twitter account yet, but uh, through the national organization, certainly uh, check out those uh, Korea TESOL news, uh, spaces as well as uh, the, the YouTube spaces that are available. Um, again, thank you very much for tuning in. For all of you that are here in this space, I see you, I see you down there. Um, I really appreciate you giving your time on this Monday evening and uh, have a great night. <laughs>